all of this news, we also had a very tragic loss. On December 7th, 2020, we lost a legend in aviation. We here at the Squawk Ident Podcast wanted to tip our hat to the man that we aviators consider to exemplify what it means to be the best of us, the number one top ace, a pioneer to what it means to be soaring above the earth, being the first to break barriers for all of us. How many times has a pilot said, I flew that bird like I was Chuck? Or I'm no Chuck, but... Well, today, we here at the Squawk Ident Podcast have decided to pay tribute to the late Brigadier General Charles Elwood Yeager. Born on February 13th, 1923, in Mira, West Virginia, to parents Susie Mae Sizemore and Albert Hal Yeager. Chuck was the son of farmers. He had four siblings, two brothers and two sisters. The family moved to Hamlin, West Virginia, where he attended Hamlin High School. There, he played basketball and football while receiving top grades in geometry and in typing. He attended the Citizens Military Training Camp at Fort Benjamin Harrison in Indianapolis, Indiana, during the summers of 1939 and 1940. He later graduated from Hamlin High School in June of 1941. Soon after graduation from high school, Yeager did what many young men did in his time. He enlisted as a private in the U.S. Army Air Forces, the USAAF, on September 12, 1941, and became an aircraft mechanic at George Air Force Base in Victorville, California. At the time of his enlistment, Yeager was not eligible for flight training because because of his age and educational background. However, the United States entry into World War II less than three months later prompted the USAAF to alter his recruiting standards. It was discovered that Jaeger had unusually sharp vision, a visual acuity rated at 20 over 10. At the time of his flight training acceptance, he was a crew chief on an AT-11. He later received his pilot wings and a promotion to flight officer at Luke Field in Arizona, where he graduated from class 43C on March 10th of 1943. He was assigned to the 357th Fighter Group in Tonopah, Nevada, where he initially trained as a fighter pilot flying Bell P-39 Aracobas. He was later shipped overseas with the group on November 23rd, 1943. Jaeger was stationed in the United Kingdom at RAF Leeston, where he flew P-51 Mustangs in combat with the 363rd Fighter Squadron. He named his P-51 Mustangs Glamorous Glenn after his girlfriend Glennis Faye Dickhouse, who later became his wife in February of 1945. Jaeger had gained one victory before he was shot down over France in his first aircraft, a P-51, on March 5th, 1944. It was on his eighth mission. He escaped to Spain on March 30th with the help of the Maquis, which is the French resistance, and returned to England on May 15th of 1944. During his stay with the Maquis, Jaeger assisted the guerrillas in duties that did not involve direct combat. He helped construct bombs for the group. He was awarded the Bronze Star for helping a navigator, Omar M. Pat Patterson Jr., to cross the Pyrenees mountain range Despite a U.S. military regulation prohibiting evaders or pilots that escaped from behind enemy lines from flying over enemy territory again to prevent resistance groups from being compromised by a second capture, Jaeger was reinstated to flying combat. Jaeger joined with another evader, a fellow P-51 pilot, First Lieutenant Fred Glover, in speaking directly to the Supreme Allied Commander General Dwight D. Eisenhower on June 12, 1944. I raised so much hell that General Eisenhower finally let me go back to my squadron, Jaeger said. He cleared me for combat after D-Day because all the free Frenchmen, Marquis, and people like that had surfaced. Eisenhower, after gaining permission from the War Department, agreed with Jaeger and Glover. In the meantime, Jaeger shot down his second enemy aircraft, a German Junkers Ju-88 bomber, over the English Channel. On October 12, 1944, he became the first pilot in his group to make ace in a day, downing five enemy aircraft in a single mission. 
Two of these kills were scored without firing a single shot. When he flew into firing position against the Messerschmitt's BF-109, the pilot of the aircraft panicked, breaking to the starboard and colliding with his wingman. Jaeger said both pilots bailed out. He finished the war with 11.5 official victories, including one of the first air-to-air victories over a jet fighter, a German Messerschmitt's ME-262, that he shot down as it was on final approach for landing. It was a P-51D 20 November Alpha that he named Glorious Glenn III that gave Jaeger most of his aerial victories. In his 1986 memoirs, Jaeger recalled with disgust that atrocities were committed by both sides and said he went on a mission with orders from the 8th Air Force to strafe anything that moved. During the mission briefing, he whispered to Major Donald H. Bakke, if we were going to do things like this, we sure as hell better make sure we are on the winning side. Jaeger was later quoted as saying, I'm certainly not proud of that particular strafing mission against civilians, but it is there on the record and in my memory. Jaeger was commissioned a second lieutenant while at Leaston and was promoted to captain before the end of his tour. He flew his 61st and final mission on January 15, 1945 and returned to the United States in early February. As an evader, he received his choice of assignments and because his wife was pregnant, chose Wright Field to be near his home in West Virginia. His high number of flight hours and maintenance experience qualified him to become a functional test pilot of repaired aircraft, which brought him under the command of Colonel Albert Boyd, head of the Aeronautical Systems Flight Test Division. Jaeger broke the sound barrier on October 14, 1947 in the X-1. He remained in the Air Force after the war. After graduation from Air Material Command Flight Performance School, Class 46C, he became a test pilot at Morocco Army Airfield, which he has which has since been renamed Edwards Air Force Base. After Bell Aircraft test pilot Chalmers Slick Goodland demanded $150,000, which is over 1.7 million in today's dollars, to break the sound barrier, the USAAF selected Jaeger to fly the rocket-powered Bell XS-1 in an NACA program to research high-speed flight. Jaeger later named the Bell X-1, which, as with all of the aircraft assigned to him, glamorous Glennis after his wife. His mission was so dangerous that the answer to many of the inherent questions at the time were promptly followed with Jaeger better have paid up his life insurance. Two nights before the scheduled date of the flight, Jaeger broke two ribs when he fell off a horse. He was worried that the injuries would remove him from the mission, and it was reported that he went to a civilian doctor in nearby Rosemond, who taped up his ribs without the Air Force even knowing about it. Besides his wife, who was riding with him, Jaeger told only his friend and fellow project pilot Jack Ridley about the accident. On the day of the flight, Jaeger was in such pain that he could not seal the X-1's hatch by himself. Ridley rigged up a device using the end of a broom handle as an extra lever to allow Jaeger to seal the hatch. Jaeger broke the sound barrier on October 14, 1947, flying the X-1 Glamorous Glennis at Mach 1.05 at an altitude of 45,000 feet over the Rogers Dry Lake bed in the Mojave Desert. The success of the mission was not announced to the public until June of 1948. Jaeger was awarded the McKay Trophy and the Collier Trophy in 1948 for his mock transcending flight and the Harmon International Trophy in 1954. The X-1 he flew that day was later put on permanent display at the Smithsonian Institution's National Air and Space Museum. Jaeger went on to break many other speed and altitude records. He was also one of the first American pilots to fly a MiG-15 after its pilots, No Kum Sok, defected to South Korea. Returning to Morocco during the later half of 1953, Jaeger was involved with the United States Air Force team 
that was working on the X-1A, an aircraft designed to surpass Mach 2 in level flight. Later that year, he flew a chase aircraft for the civilian pilot Jackie Cochran, as she became the first woman to fly faster than sound. On November 20th, 1953, the U.S. Navy program involving the D-5582 Skyrocket and its pilot, Scott Crossfield, became the first team to reach twice the speed of sound. After they were bested, Ridley and Jaeger decided to beat rival Crossfield's speed record in a series of test flights that they dubbed Operation Naka Weep. Not only did they beat Crossfield by setting a new record at Mach 2.44 on December 12, 1953, but they did it in time to spoil a celebration planned for the 50th anniversary of flight in which Crossfield was to be called the fastest man alive. The new record flight, however, did not entirely go to plan since shortly after reaching Mach 2.44, Jaeger lost control of the X-1A at about 80,000 feet due to inertia coupling a phenomenon largely unknown at the time. With the aircraft simultaneously rolling, pitching, and yawing out of control, Jaeger dropped to 51,000 feet in in less than a minute before regaining control at around 29,000 feet. He then managed to land without further incident. For this achievement, Jaeger was awarded the Distinguished Service Medal in 1954. Jaeger was foremost a fighter pilot and held several squadron and wing commands. From 1954 to 1957, he commanded the F-86H Sabre-equipped 417th Fighter Bomber Squadron, the 50th Fighter Bomber Wing at Han Air Base in West Germany, and Toul Rishures Air Base in France. And from 1957 to 1960, the F-100D Super Sabre-equipped First Fighter Day Squadron at George Air Force Base in California and Moran Air Base in Spain. By 1962, he was awarded the rank of full colonel after completion of a year's studies and final thesis on the STOL or Stoll aircraft at the Air War College. Yeager became the first commandant of the USAF Aerospace Research Pilot School, which produced astronauts for NASA and the USAF. After its redesignation from the U.S. Air Force's Flight Test Pilot School. Fun fact Jaeger himself had only a high school education, so he was not eligible to become an astronaut like those that he trained. In April 1962, Jaeger flew for the only time with Neil Armstrong. Their job, flying a T 33, was to evaluate Smith Ranch Dry Lake in Nevada for use as an emergency landing site for the X 15. In his autobiography, Jaeger wrote that he knew the lake bed was unsuitable for landings after recent rains, but Armstrong insisted on flying out anyway. As they attempted to uh, touch and go, the wheels became stuck and they had to wait for rescue. Between December 1963 and January 1964, Jaeger completed five flights in the NASA M2 F1 lifting body. An accident during a December 1963 test flight in one of the school's NF-104s eventually put an end to his record attempts. In 1966, Jaeger took command of the 405th Tactical Fighter Wing at Clark Air Force Base in the Philippines. His squadrons were deployed on rotational temporary duty in South Vietnam and elsewhere in Southeast Asia. There he flew 127 missions. In February 1968, Jaeger was assigned command of the 4th Tactical Fighter Wing at Seymour Johnson Air Force Base, North Carolina, and led the McDonnell Douglas F-4 Phantom II Wing in South Korea during the Pueblo Crisis. Jaeger was promoted to Brigadier General and was assigned in July 1969 as the Vice Commander of the 17th Air Force. From 1971 to 1973, at the behest of Ambassador Joe Farland, Jaeger was assigned to Pakistan to advise the Pakistan Air Force. A small passenger aircraft that was assigned by the Pentagon to Jaeger was damaged during an air raid by the Indian Air Force at a Pakistan air base during the 1971 war between India and Pakistan. Edward C. Ingram, a U.S. diplomat 
who had served as political counselor to Ambassador Farland in Islamabad, recalled this incident in the Washington Monthly of October of 1985. He was quoted as saying, After Jaeger's Beechcraft was destroyed during an Indian air raid, he raged to his cowering colleagues that the Indian pilot that had been specifically instructed by Indira Gandhi to blast his plane, it was, he later wrote, the Indian way of giving Uncle Sam the finger. Jaeger was incensed over the incident and demanded U.S. retaliation. On March 1, 1975, following assignments in Germany and Pakistan, Jaeger retired from the U.S. Air Force at Norton Air Force Base, California. Jaeger made a cameo appearance in the movie The Right Stuff in 1983. He played Fred, a bartender, at Pancho's place, which was most appropriate, as Jaeger said, if all the hours were ever totaled, I reckon I spent more time at her place than in a cockpit over those years. His own role in the movie was played by Sam Shepard. For several years in the 1980s, Jaeger was connected to General Motors, publicizing AC Delco, the company's automotive parts division. In 1986, he was invited to drive the Chevrolet Corvette pace car for the 70th running of the Indianapolis 500, and again in 1988, this time at the wheel of an Oldsmobile Cutlass Supreme. In 1986, President Reagan appointed Jaeger to the Rogers Commission that investigated the explosion of the Space Shuttle Challenger. During this time, Jaeger also served as a technical advisor for three Electronic Arts Flight Simulator video games. The games include Chuck Jaeger's Advanced Flight Trainer, Chuck Jaeger's Advanced Flight Trainer 2.0, and Chuck Jaeger's Air Combat. The game manuals featured quotes and anecdotes from Jaeger, and all were well received by players. Missions featured several of Jaeger's accomplishments and let players attempt to top his records. Chuck Yeager's Advanced Flight Trainer was Electronic Arts' top-selling game for 1987. In 2009, Yeager participated in the documentary The Legend of Poncho Barnes and Happy Bottom Riding Club, a profile of his friend Poncho Barnes. The documentary was screened at film festivals, aired on public television in the United States, and won an Emmy Award. On October 14th of 1997, on the 50th anniversary of his historic flight past Mach 1, he flew a new Glamorous Glen III, an F-15D Eagle, past Mach 1. The chase plane for the flight was an F-16 Fighting Falcon piloted by Bob Hoover, a longtime test pilot, fighter, and acrobatic pilot. He had been Jaeger's wingman for the first supersonic flight. At the end of his speech to the crowd in 1997, Jaeger concluded, All that I am, I owe to the Air Force. Later that month, he was a recipient of the Tony Janus Award for his achievements. On October 14th of 2012, on the 65th anniversary of breaking the sound barrier, Jaeger did it again at the age of 89, flying as co-pilot in a McDonnell Douglas F-15 Eagle piloted by Captain Dave Vincent of the Nellis Air Force Base. In 1973, Jaeger was inducted into the National Aviation Hall of Fame, arguably aviation's highest honor. In 1974, Jaeger received the Golden Plate Award of the American Academy of Achievement. In December 1975, the U.S. Congress awarded Jaeger a silver medal equivalent to a non-combat medal of honor for contributing immeasurably to aerospace science by risking his life in piloting the X-1 research airplane faster than the speed of sound on October 14, 1947. President Gerald Ford presented the medal to Jaeger in a ceremony at the White House on December 8, 1976. Jaeger, who never attended college and was often modest about his background, is considered by many, including Flying Magazine, the California Hall of Fame, the State of West Virginia, the National Aviation Hall of Fame, a few U.S. presidents, and the United States Air Army Air Force to be one of the greatest pilots of all time. Despite his lack of higher education, he was honored in his home state. Marshall University has named its highest academic scholarship the Society of Jaeger Scholars in his honor. Jaeger was also the chairman 
of Experimental Aircraft Association's Young Eagle program from 1994 to 2004, and was named the program's chairman emeritus. In 1966, Jaeger was inducted into the International Air and Space Hall of Fame. He was inducted into the International Space Hall of Fame in 1981. He was inducted into Aerospace Walk of Honor 1990 inaugural class. Jaeger Airport in Charleston, West Virginia is named in his honor. The Interstate 64 Interstate 77 bridge over the Kanawha River in Charleston is named in his honor. He also flew directly under the Kanawha Bridge, and West Virginia named it to the Chuck E. Yeager Bridge. On October 19th of 2006, the state of West Virginia also honored Yeager with a marker along Corridor G, part of U.S. Highway 119, in his home Lincoln County, and also renamed part of the highway the Yeager Highway. Yeager was an honorary board member of the humanitarian organization Wings of Hope. On August 25, 2009, Governor Arnold Schwarzenegger and Maria Shriver announced that Jaeger would be one of 13 California Hall of Fame inductees in the California Museum's year-long exhibit. The induction ceremony was on December 1, 2009 in Sacramento, California. Flying Magazine ranked Jaeger number five on its 2013 list of the 51 heroes of aviation. For many years, he was the highest ranked living person on the list. The Civil Air Patrol, the volunteer auxiliary of the U.S. Air Force, awards the Charles E. Chuck Yeager Award to its senior members as part of its aerospace education program. We all know the name Chuck Yeager, but did any of us really understand the man behind the legendary name? To say he was the best of us is not a hard idea to agree with. So many aviators have honored his legacy with phrases like, I'm no Chuck Yeager, but, or I made a landing that even Chuck would approve of. On December 7th of this year, 2020, we lost a great aviator and mentor to us all. So raise a glass to Chuck. You will be missed, but never forgotten. And in closing, uh, a customary and traditional um, saying to fighter pilots that have moved on to the um, heavenly side, we use a phrase, toss a nickel on the grass. So here's a little quote that um, I took out of an article that basically sums up the quote. So here's a nickel on the grass to you, my friend, and your spirit, enthusiasm, sacrifice, and courage. But most of all, to your friendship. Yours is a dying breed, and when you are gone, the world will be a lesser place. Thanks, Chuck. Thank you, Chuck. So this was a really cool thing to, to do. Uh, I think this is the first time that the three of us have sat down to pay tribute to a fallen aviator. And I got to say, it was a very enlightening research uh, t- to get done. I uh, used primarily the interwebs to find all this information. Uh, let me just say there'll be a Wikipedia link in the show notes uh, where you can find the information and hyperlinks to every little aspect of this uh, this tribute. Uh, man, talk about an inspiration. Uh, to fly to, I, to with broken ribs and and do something oh, like man. that. I mean, granted, he hit it from sure. the U.S. Air Force, which would undoubtedly have <laughs> grounded him uh, and put in the replacement. Yeah. But we would yeah. not be saying to this day, you know, the best of us is Chuck. Uh, how many yeah. times have we heard that? I mean, so it's an inspiring story. Yeah. It's a testament of to the, uh, the individuals back in the, that day who were willing to risk their lives for to better, you know, the cause. and. Um, you know, this whole um, age and time, 19, what, a 50s, 1960s, you know, they're trying to, um, you know, advance aviation. And they really, you know, didn't have anything to help them other than their, you know, intuitive minds, their curious minds, and, you know, just the great uh, engineers that they had back in the day to try to figure out how to break the sound barrier and all the challenges that it posed. And, you know, they didn't have, they, I guess I was watching an episode where they were talking about having um, a wind tunnel tests 
of some of these models to try to break the sound barrier. And he was saying they were able to, to, you know, to replicate or, or actually break the sound barrier of, of the, of the model in the wind tunnel. But he said the problem that they were experiencing was whenever the shock wave would form, the wind tunnels di- the dimensions would distort the actual shock wave. So they never actually had accurate data beyond the actual shock wave. Uh, so they had no way of knowing what was going to really happen in the real flight. And the only way to do it is <laughs> for somebody like Chuck to volunteer and say, I'll do it. <laughs> and then go up there and, and uh, test it out. And, uh, you know, as we all know, the air, you know, is, is very, very unforgiving. I mean, there's zero room for error and anything, you know, just the smallest miscalculation um, can result in, in, you know, death or destruction of the aircraft. So uh, these guys were very, very brave. Yeah. It, yeah. I mean, think of how crazy it was to, to go out and, and basically volunteer to do something like that. Then also thinking about all the engineers who came up with this stuff because they had no information to go on totally. either. Yeah. And then, you know, in, in our case, Jaeger putting his hands in, in those engineers, you know, his life in their hands. Yeah. yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. But, yeah. But having no information because aviation was still so young back then and no part of the greatest it. generation. It's part of the greatest Any generation. Idea what was going to happen? And those guys, you know, trying putting their heads together and saying, hey, well, you know, I think this sounds good. And then, you know, Jaeger going, okay, well, sure. I, I like what you guys said. Let's go try it because, you know, what can go wrong? <laughs> you know, yep. <laughs> what can go wrong? <laughs> Never ask that question when you're a test pilot. <laughs> What's the worst that can happen? Uh, yeah, yeah. Nickels in the grass. That's the worst amazing. that can happen, I tell you yep. right now. Yeah.